Um, happy Valentine's Day to everybody. Uh, we were reminded last week that this is Black History Month. It's also the time of Mardi Gras, carnival in much of the world. A time when costume, color, and masks fill the streets, complicating lines of class, gender, race, and difference. A time when diversity is celebrated and cultures of resistance have their way in the street. It's also the time of Ash Wednesday in the Christian tradition that teaches of dust thou art and to dust thou shalt return. So we stand in this time when diversity and the dust of which we are made stand side by side. This month, when the C3 value is diversity, we respect the dignity and worth of every individual, of all people, all genders, sexual orientations, ethnicities, and abilities. So today, on Valentine's Day, when the heart is at the center of our attention, it's a good day to reflect on love and diversity and belonging. Some trace the origins of Valentine's Day to the Roman Empire and a priest named Valentine. And the Roman Empire at that time didn't want the legions going off to war to marry because it would make them soft. And so marriage was prohibited. And this little Valentine, this priest, was conducting clandestine marriages for the legions that were going off to war. And so my friends, my Catholic nun friends who are always recruiting their saints to the peace movement would teach me about St. Valentine's and, and that he was an earlier, earlier teacher of civil disobedience, a man who put courage of the heart at the center at a time when love was forbidden and power was loved. For me, Valentine's Day is very meaningful for a couple of reasons. First, my daughter Carmen, my oldest daughter, was almost born on Valentine's Day 27 years ago. <laughs> she was two weeks overdue and nothing was happening and the midwife told me, I want you to take this really large dose of castor oil for supper and she'll be here tonight on Valentine's Day. So I did, I took this really dark, low, large dose of, uh, of castor oil at supper. The only problem was um, supper for her meant lunch and it meant dinner for me and so the timing was all off. And <laughs> rather than being born on Valentine's Day, she came well after midnight on the 15th, which was also a good day to be born because it's Susan B. Anthony's birthday. A Quaker woman who worked to abolish slavery and worked for the rights of women and dedicated her life to the inherent dignity and worth of all human beings. And my daughter Carmen is named after Carmen Mendieta, who is a Nicaraguan woman, a peasant farmer and mother and team member of ours and mentor of mine. And like many others during the 1980s, she was a woman who dreamt and struggled for a society in which everyone belonged. And she organized among the poor peasant communities in the mountains of Nicaragua. And when I read in the ambassador newsletter Parker Palmer's words, I was reminded that this time when she was struggling to organize peasant communities was a time of political madness where those who held political beliefs that were different from the United States and struggled to create societies of belonging were demonized and wars were waged. And so one evening when refugees fled into her community late at night and there was no food and no water and nowhere for them to sleep, Carmen got up before dawn and got on the first truck leaving her village and was on her way into town where we lived to get help, to get supplies to take back. But an ambush had been set on the road and there was a landmine and it blew up the truck she was traveling in, killing her and two other women. 
and her story is for another day. But today, she reminds me of the importance of holding the dignity and the worth of every individual, always in the center of our hearts, and to struggle to make sure that this value beats at the center of our public, domestic, and foreign policies, so there will be no more political madness, and our children will be born into societies of belonging like the one Carmen, my mentor, dreamt and died for. My friend, an Episcopal priest in this area, teaches a class on sexual diversity and Christianity here in Western Michigan. And he says, I always start when working in the churches with my story. And I ask people to share their stories. I start by moving out of the head and out of scripture and into real lives and hearts. So this morning on Valentine's Day, I wanted to start with the story that kept presenting itself to me, and that's the story of my uncles, who each in their own way taught me about love, diversity, and belonging. The first was my great uncle, who was born on Valentine's Day. He was a man from the Midwest, a football player. He went into the army, he went to Korea, he came back to live in Washington, D.C., and had his career in the FBI under Hoover. His plan when he came back, and planned with my aunt, was to have six children, all boys, all redheads. <laughs> that was the plan. <laughs> and no children came, and they had to let go of that plan. And fortunately for us, they opened their hearts and their lives to two generations of nieces and nephews. And we showed up with so much. Divorce, sexual diversity, AIDS, friends who were racially, ethnically, and religiously diverse, politics that challenged everything. And at every turn, my uncle, my great uncle, and aunt, they did their inner work, they grew, and they kept opening their hearts to us. Parker Palmer, Quaker educator, says a sense of belonging is needed to support the emergence of the authentic self. If we are willing to embrace the challenge of becoming whole, we cannot embrace it alone. We need trustworthy relationships to support us, tenacious communities of support and belonging to sustain the journey toward an undivided life. The emergence of the soul requires a rare but real, real form of community that I call a circle of trust. My great uncle was really important in providing that circle of trust and a support so that we could all show up and present our authentic selves and stay close to the way we were made. Dismantling social constructs that we inherited about what was acceptable, who was to be excluded, and who was to be othered, and find ourselves still belonging. In my case, when my work in human rights led me to Central America and to speak out about US policy and its impact on the people of Central America and to work for the government of Nicaragua at a time when it was considered an enemy, they listened, respected, they received my friends from Central America. And at one point, my great uncle said to me, working at the FBI, they're watching me now because of you. And I said, I'm sorry, Uncle Bill. And he said, don't be, I'm proud of you, keep on. And when my book was published, he and my aunt were some of the first to buy a bunch of copies and give them to their friends in Washington. And one of his nephews, my Uncle Bill, whose birthday was the day before Valentine's Day, was a Harvard grad and a professor of Japanese literature. And as a little girl, I would look forward to him coming home at Christmas time from Japan and bringing gifts from this faraway land. The best were the kimonos, beautiful white soft ones for springtime and red silk ones for winter. And he would bring us little socks, Japanese socks and Japanese wooden shoes and these sashes 
and he would dress us up and tie us into the kimonos, and he would put books, our school books, in the sleeves and teach us how the Japanese girls would carry their books to school. And they, he enriched and expanded our world. And one year, my uncle came back from Japan and he brought his life partner, my uncle Shigeru. And at the time, we were thrilled to have another uncle. I was unaware of the risk they were taking to live and love in this world, to stay close to the way they were made. I was unaware of how courageous they were being. I got a glimpse of it every once in a while when I'd be talking about my uncles and someone would say, you have an uncle from Japan, well, who's he married to? And I would say, well, he's the partner of my other uncle. And eyes would kind of bulge and people would try to find a way out of the room. And I began to learn that at this time, <laughs> their relationship was still considered technically to be uh, a mental illness, that it was criminalized in many parts of the world, that they were not allowed to be married, that it would be a liability for them to find a place to live, to make a career in academia. They were pathologized and condemned in many churches. And that just as scripture was used to justify slavery, segregation, and the subordination of women, it was used to shame and condemn them. And when I got older, I saw how my uncles carried themselves through this minefield with dignity and caution. Clarissa Pinkola Estes, a Jungian psychologist, says, for decades there has been one huge difference between heterosexual and LGBT persons. I know that to be born gay or lesbian or bisexual or transgender carries a far extra ration of being shamed by others, by the culture, and sometimes most wounding by one's own family. Not a one-time wounding, a continuous one, carried out on TV, radio, newspapers, in print, and from pulpits. I know that some use the word abomination, as one minister shouted at me. When I was in seminary, we didn't have a lot of language for how to respond to shaming and attacks. We were beginning to have professors who were out and that helped to create space to have conversations to speak safely and to make little circles of trust. But virtually everybody was caught in this titanic battle over what the Bible says. And years of study, lives, and reams of paper were dedicated to asserting and refuting what church historian Martin Marty calls five inches of ancient culturally conditioned text. And the conversation was always linked to scripture and stayed in the head. It didn't enter the heart, and it wasn't very helpful in real life. Clarissa Pinkola Stace writes about a time when she published an article affirming sexual diversity. She said, I knew from experience and other matters that speaking out, in, of speaking out, that people can sometimes be not very loving and most bewilderingly of all, Self-same people sometimes call themselves Christ-like. On this occasion, among other nice pieces of hate mail and hate faxes that came in response to my article, someone had gotten a hold of my phone number and called unexpectedly. I picked up the phone and the stranger, a man on the other end of the line, greeted me with, you fat commie lesbian? I was startled and the words jumped out of my mouth. Listen you, I resent being called fat and slammed down the phone. <laughs> it's challenging to find a way to respond to hate. We are shocked, we're left speechless, communication breaks down or seems impossible. My friend, a minister, tells of a time in the presence of a religious leader who was speaking very hateful words about sexual diversity, and she said, my mind was frozen in disbelief. I didn't know what to do, did not want to enter into scriptural battle, did not want to punch him, and was not going to remain silent. And she said, without knowing what had even happened, I found that my hand had come up and was resting on his heart. And I said, please stop, this hurts. And there was a pause and a hush and a stepping back from that angry pulpit. 
Old Testament scholar Walter Brueggemann says, I have the deep conviction that the adrenaline that gathers about issues of sexuality is not really about sexuality. It is about the unarticulated sense people have of being out of control, that the world may be falling apart, and a grasping for control. It's almost a deliberate smokescreen to keep from having to talk about anything that gets into the real, deeper issues of our lives and hearts. Progress has been made in this country. We have the Matthew Shepard and James Byrd Act to prevent hate crimes, the Supreme Court decision on marriage equality, but there's still a need for progress. According to statistics on homelessness, 40% of homeless youth serviced by agencies identify as LGBT, and they commit suicide at much higher rates than heterosexual youth. In 2014, World Vision, this huge US charity that sponsors children in the developing world, announced that they would no longer discriminate based on sexual orientation. But when conservative evangelical donors immediately ceased support for almost 10,000 children, within two days, World Vision reversed its decision, saying that this was a confusing mistake and asking for forgiveness. In January, the Anglican Communion suspended the US Episcopal Church for three years because of its position on marriage equality. In Honduras, the accompaniment project that we worked with provided international accompaniment for an organization called Arcoiris, that means rainbow, that works for human rights and sexual diversity. In February this, this month, I got an alert from them saying that they'd experienced a step up in attacks. They've had six murders within the last eight months. My daughter, the younger one, is in college here in Western Michigan, and one of the most difficult things about her transition has been encounters with racist, xenophobic language and the active shunning of those who are not white or heterosexual. She says it helps to talk about it, to have a place to talk about what's happening with students and at home. It helps when people speak up and say, stop, this hurts, this does harm. It helps when teachers create a safe place to talk in the classroom and that this is rare. She says what would really help would be more heart-centered conversation in the larger community, in families, in schools, in churches, for teachers and leaders and parents to keep pressing for progress, to dismantle the constructs of othering and get at what really lies underneath this hate, to create circles of trust and belonging. It helps to share our stories about what we've learned about love, diversity, and belonging from precisely those that the culture tries to tell us do not belong. So back to my story about my uncles. From my two uncles, I learned courage, dignity, commitment, solidarity, and soul. One of my cousins tells the story of painting my uncle's house one summer. And they had hired him to paint their house because he needed money for the summer, he needed a summer job. So he was painting the outside of the house and he was up on ladders with the windows open and he said, I was really into hip hop and rap music, so I had the music blaring full blast for about four days. And he said, I think it was getting on their nerves. <laughs> so one day my uncle called him down off the ladder and said, come on inside, I'd like to introduce you to someone. He said, and he introduced me to civil rights leader, Queen of Gospel, Mahalia Jackson. And he said, my uncle taught me what it means to be a really good teacher. My uncles taught me about spirituality. These two atheist men who were deeply drawn to ancient Shinto temples in Japan. Each of them carry always with them a little bodhisattva, their own particular one, their teacher, their talisman. 
an incense favorite fragrance from the temples, always burning slowly on household altars, where random simple things of everyday beauty were placed. I learned a lot about creating a home rich in diversity of friends, languages, culture, food, music, often opera very loud, sometimes Mahalia Jackson, and always flowers. Mary Oliver has a poem that says this. To live in this world, you must be able to do three things. To love what is mortal, to hold it against your bones, knowing that your own life depends on it. And when the time comes, to let it go. Let it go. I know that your loved ones have taught you these three things. And I know some of you are living this poem right now. In my life, my uncles taught me these three things. Several years ago, my Uncle Bill returned from a year teaching in Japan. He taught a full semester back here in the United States, turned in all his grades, and said he didn't feel right. And he went into the hospital after two weeks, my uncle Shigeru called me and said, we need you to come, we don't know what's happening. And when I got there, it was very clear that my uncle did not have long to live. He was ever dignified and courageous. He had two baskets going at the side of his hospital bed. One, things to take to Vermont, because as soon as I get out of here, we're going to Vermont and getting married. And the other, things to make sure that everything is okay for Shigeru in case I don't get out of here, because we were never able to get married. And on one New Year's Eve morning, Shigeto and I were on the way to the hospital, and he started shaking his head, and he said, not good. And I said, what do you mean, Shigeto? And he said, red sky at night, sailors delight. Red sky at morning, sailors take morning, Bill always say. And I said, Shigeto, it's perfectly clear he said, look behind us, and he was looking in the rearview mirror, and I turned, and the whole sky was red. The doctor was waiting for us at my uncle's door, and my uncle said, I want to go home. So tubes were removed, and Shigeru said, I'm going ahead of you. I'm going to go get the house ready. And dear friend Deb, our friend from Italy, an amazing cook, said, Bill, what do you want to eat? You haven't eaten in almost two weeks. Tell me, I'll make it. Everyone should have a friend from Italy who's a really good cook. <laughs> and my uncle's had two. <laughs> and it was decided fresh lemon sorbet, raspberry, the other favorite, would be too much. And later that night, the great doors of the hospital swung open and we wheeled my uncle out onto the parking lot where the transport van was waiting, and a blast of freezing air slammed into us, taking our breath away. And an enormous winter full moon flooded onto us like a spotlight. And my uncle said, stop, look at it. It's so beautiful. And we stopped the gurney, and we sat there for a while, him in his little hospital gown, gazing at the moon under a light snow. And then once we got in the transport van, the EMT co-pilot found out that my uncle was a professor of Japanese literature and said, well, tell me about the samurai. I'm fascinated with the samurai warrior. And so my uncle taught him. He said, let me tell you something about the spirit and the soul of the samurai. And that was the conversation all the way home. And when we got home, his home had been transformed into a temple. Every candle was lit, flowers everywhere, favorite fragrance slowly burning. Friends in their rich array of diversity were gathered around. Lemon sorbet was served, and my uncle spoke to us. He said, you must know, this is what life is all about. This moment, this one taste of lemon sorbet, surrounded by beauty and the people you love, this belonging, it's all about that. And my atheist, bodhisattva loving uncle gave us communion that night. 
the next morning, it was clear he was letting go fast. There was no time to call anyone, but friends started arriving at the door, banging on the door. What's going on? Something told me I was out doing something, and something told me I needed to get over to the house right now. And we rushed them into the room, and they ran to his bedside, sliding into it as if to home plate. And the last words to his partners uttered with such an effort from somewhere so far away, unmistakable, I love you. The hospice nurse arrived to take care of his body, and my uncle Shigeru said, oh no, he's mine. She looked at me like, does he know what he's doing? And I said, he's got it. And he came and got me after a little while and said, come on, you can see him now, he's beautiful. And my uncle was so beautiful. There he was in a ceremonial kimono, looking like all the samurai warrior, or Shinto priest. Objects lovingly placed on his body, eyeglasses, because he was a scholar, favorite fragrance, a line of poetry, and his bodhisattva. My uncle was translating a novel by one of his favorite writers, Japanese novelist Ishikawa Jun, when he died. The title of the book was The Bad Boys of the Gods. No kidding? These were the last words he translated. It felt as though a breeze blew up from the bed. It lifted the flowers from the basket and scattered them in every direction. Petal by petal, they danced in the air and then fell to the ground. <clears throat> a few years later, Shigeru came to visit us in Nicaragua. And he kept saying, it's so much like Japan, the volcanoes, the people's love of poetry, the poverty reminded him of Japan after the war, the heat, the Pacific Ocean, and we went to the ocean. We spent one unforgettable night out on a high bluff with the surge of dark waves rocking and crashing below us, illuminated by glints of light from the sliver of a moon. And he said, I wish your Uncle Bill was here to see this place and these people that you love. And I said, I do too. And I wish he could have met Carmen Mendieta and so many others. And there was sadness and love and a very palpable sense of belonging to something so very vast, so much larger than ourselves. Some mystery that wended its way from the wild coastline of Nicaragua to Shigeru's island home somewhere far out in that Pacific Ocean, to a beloved orchard in Vermont where ashes were spread, and to a daughter named after a woman who dreamt of a society of belonging, and we fell asleep under the stars. Theologian Franciscan priest Richard Orr says, the cosmos, the whole of creation, is about two things, diversity and communion. Last year, after the killing of nine members of the historic Emmanuel AME Church in South Carolina, people in South Carolina called on the white community to press for progress. They said, this has to stop. When you hear people speaking with disdain or hatred towards any group of people, there's a responsibility to speak up. Parker Palmer says, if you find yourself in a situation where someone is demeaning people who are different, don't remain silent. Say very simply, those words are personally hurtful to me. I want to live in a world where we respect each other. We can press for progress by teaching about national and international law and resolutions and declarations that affirm and uphold the universal inherent dignity and worth of every individual. We can hold this at the center of our hearts and work to make it be the heartbeat of our communities of public, domestic, and foreign policy, so there will be no more madness. So children will be born into societies where the diversity of our dust 
is celebrated and loved, and we can taste the universal belonging that is at the heart of all mystical traditions. And we can press for progress by sharing our stories, creating tenacious communities of belonging, helping others to bring their authentic selves to the world and stay close to the way we are made. So today, think about the people in your life who've taught you about love, diversity, and belonging, who've opened your heart, who've enriched your life, your community, your country, and share your story with someone else and ask them to tell them yours, theirs, and make that your gift on this Valentine's Day. Happy Valentine's Day. <laughs>